National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for November 2008. I'm Kristen Jenkins. When we hunt and butcher game, or live in close quarters with domestic animals, we are exposed to the pathogens those animals carry, giving pathogens the opportunity to try out a new host. In some cases, the pathogen is able to successfully infect human hosts. In other cases, the pathogen fails. Understanding how and when pathogens in the environment evolve to become human pathogens can help us better understand and control the diseases we have now and prevent future transfers. Dr. Katya Cole, an assistant professor of biology at Duke University, studies the evolution of infectious diseases. In this interview, she talks about some unexpected information we can learn from reconstructing viral histories. So viruses can be very useful in understanding um, or piecing together historical events because viruses uh, very, very rapidly mutate. Um, and so if we have a sample of, the, of a viral population, uh, we can understand certain things about the population that it infects. So uh, I want to provide an, an analogy of how this actually works first. Um, so you can imagine some kind of relay race in, in New York City, in Manhattan. Um, and, and the race starts with, it's a it's very unorthodox race, um, and it starts off with just one person at the starting line. Um, and that person has this baton. And that person hands, can replicate its baton and hand it off to all of its friends that go running in different directions and do the same. So over time, um, the people who are in the race, there are more and more people in the race, and they're also uh, in uh, all over the city after a while, um, or spreading from where the race started. Uh, so you can imagine this as an analogy to viruses, where at a specific point in time, we can, we can sample the viral population, which are kind of like those, those runners. Um, and from um, know, uh, knowing what uh, the genetics are of that virus, we can we can use that information to get an idea of, of uh, when, when and where really this, this race started. So, um, so uh, um, uh, when did that first, uh, where was that first runner? Where did, where did that infection actually start? Um, so uh, Michael Warby's work on, uh, and his colleagues' work on HIV uh, was really groundbreaking because um, they found a, a, a virus which was very, very genetically distinct, um, very different in nucleotide sequence um, from the viruses that had been previously isolated. Um, so the previous viruses that had been isolated were kind of like runners on 125th Street. Um, but what they found was actually kind of a runner out you know, in Brooklyn with this new sequence. Um, so what's really exciting is that because they found this, this runner off really far away, um, they actually uh, realized that um, uh, the race must have been going on for longer, um, basically. Uh, so they figured out through this, this, this new sequence, having data on this new, new viral sequence, that HIV has been in the population not since the 1940s or 1950s, as was first estimated, but much earlier, about 1900. Um, so that's one way that viral uh, data can actually be used to, to estimate when um, some of these, these events actually occurred. Would you describe other examples of how this approach has been used? Uh, another example is, um, is uh, a story um, or an event that happened a couple of years ago. Um, there were these five Bulgarian nurses in Libya, uh, and they were... Um, they were accused of, uh, of infecting children at this hospital with HIV um, and with hepatitis C virus. Uh, and the Libyan government had, um, was, was putting them on trial and would possibly give them um, uh, a death sentence. Uh, so some evolutionary biologists um, uh, um, contacted the children that were infected with HIV and hepatitis C virus. Um, some of these children went over to Europe afterwards to be treated, and so they contacted them and, um, and sampled the virus from them, 
And from those very diverse samples, um, they determined the time at which these individuals were most likely infected. Um, and so from that diversity of samples, they figured out that they must have been infected before the nurses even showed up at that hospital. So that's another way to use viral sequence data to um, understand or, or get an idea of what happened historically um, without ha having direct data um, from, um, uh, from, from that time. Uh, a third example, um, besides the HIV example in, for, with Libyan nurses um, and in the more recent story with Michael Warby's HIV work, uh, is a story uh, about um, uh, these, these cougars in the western United States. So these, these cougars in the western United States uh, are infected with something called FIV, feline immunodeficiency virus. It's related to HIV, only it doesn't cause any symptoms for the cats. Um, so researchers put out a question. Um, uh, they asked, well, what has been happening to, to the cougar population um, over the last few, few decades? Um, have they uh, had, had population lows? Um, are their populations increasing now? Um, so what can we actually understand about cougar population sizes in the past? Uh, so what they did, um, they didn't have any direct data on it, so they didn't know. Um, so what they decided to do was they decided to actually look at, again, uh, viral sequences, current viral sequences that these cougars had. So they went out and they sampled these big cats um, and they sequenced their viruses. Uh, and because these viruses mutate very rapidly, they can be used as this, this clock to, to, to date certain events. And what they found out was that in, in certain regions, um, the viral population was, was uh, genetically not that diverse. Um, and in other populations, it was, it was also not that diverse, but it was, it was different. So what they were able to, uh, um, what they were able to, to show was through looking at these sequence, sequences, um, that there was really this geographic separation and that the, the cougar population um, went through a significant uh, population low. Um, and that's why these genetic sequences of this virus were very different in different areas. So those are three examples, um, very clear examples of how uh, viruses can, can be used to, to, uh, um, uh, for us to really get at, um, at an understanding of what ha has happened historically. Uh, um, without actually having direct data from there, um, because we're, we're really inferring it from these, these, uh, from these viral data. Will you please tell us more about your research? One thing that I find very interesting with respect to, to these viruses um, evolving and evolving so rapidly is that for some viruses, um, uh, for example, also with measles, um, um, a lot of these, these, these changes don't, don't have any kind of um, uh, they don't change the face of the virus. Um, so those can be used for, for, uh, for certain things like reconstructing historical events, trying to find out um, uh, what happened when, et cetera. Um, there's another class of mutations where those, the mutations to um, the virus um, actually do alter um, the face of the virus, um, and it's really the face of the virus that our immune system sees. And so for things like influenza, um, the virus is uh, very rapidly evolving as it goes through the human population. And, and sometimes those changes allow for escape from, from immunity. And so a, a, a mutation results in a virus um, which then uh, has, uh, can, uh, can, has a lot of individuals who are susceptible um, uh, uh, around it. Um, and so that... So that virus can actually spread much more quickly than a virus that, that had a lot of individuals in the population that were already immune to it. Um, and so trying to understand um, through incorporating genetic data, um, trying to understand uh, how viruses actually can escape from, from immunity is, is, I think, very interesting. Um, and then... And then... Um, um, and then... Uh, and then how, how viral evolution actually affects how quickly a disease spreads and how many people get infected um, over time. 
Um, so that's another aspect of, of viral evolution, which is, which is very interesting and which I'm focusing on in my research. What do you enjoy about your work? Uh, so what I enjoy, I think, about my, my research most is uh, are a number of different things. One is, is that you can, a lot, you can use a lot of different tools from different subjects um, to address problems um, in, in, well, in public health, um, and specifically with respect to, to viruses in the population. Um, so I use a combination of, of mathematical approaches, and I use statistics, um, and, and also concepts from, from uh, ecology and, of course, from evolution. So all those things, all those subjects have to be integrated um, in order to be able to understand things like how quickly a virus passes through a population, um, how quickly it evolves, um, and, and things along that line, um, how, how much of a disease burden it, it produces in the population. Uh, so, uh, so we need to actually uh, have a very interdisciplinary approach to, to understanding these, these patterns. Um, the second thing I really enjoy about the research is that, um, is that diseases and viral diseases are, are a really great uh, model system, system to, to try to address questions that are open in the field of ecology and evolution. Um, specifically, uh, there's, there's a lot of research going on right now um, in what is called contemporary evolution, uh, which shows that um, in, in, that shows uh, that evolution um, occurs very, very rapidly um, for many organisms. Um, so that includes things like um, the finches that, that Darwin studied. They evolve very rapidly, even on the order of, of decades. Um, and a, a lot of other organisms, such as, as salmon, are known to evolve very rapidly, especially um, when you think of, of uh, fishing pressures um, and selection coming from those fishing pressures. So there are all these different examples of how uh, evolution in organisms is occurring very, very rapidly on the order uh, and time scale of, of decades. Um, so I think diseases, viral diseases, provide um, another uh, really great example of this, where viruses that are that are evolving over the time scale of, of decades um, oftentimes allow for individuals to get reinfected um, because they're evolving with respect to um, uh, their their uh, being able to escape, escape immunity. Um, of the host population. Um, so there's a really nice interface, I think, between a lot of ecological and evolutionary topics and topics which are um, uh, really at the interface of, of public health. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.